Good afternoon. Good morning to all of our listeners today. Um, excited for today's webinar, The Last Digital Mile, that we're going to talk about some of the div digital service channels. Um, my name is Chad McDaniel. I'm the president of Execs in the Know, and I'll be the moderator of today's webinar. And I had I was briefly reviewing our attendee list for today's webinar, and just uh, excited and amazed to see the great brands and the people that are listening to today's uh, webinar. So thank you for your support and your participation. I promise not to pick on anyone and call anyone out, but I know a number of you um, on the line here. So uh, thank you for participating in uh, uh, precinct. So with that said, um, as I started out a little a couple of minutes ago, I just want to remind everyone to ensure they've dialed in depending on their country location. Uh, if you're in Canada, dial in on the 647 prefix, and then the United States, the 312, just to keep international tolls separate for everybody. Um, if any of our listeners, just an FY before I get started, happen to be in the Boston area, I'm excited to be in Boston uh, next Thursday night, June 11th. We are hosting a private dinner uh, to discuss some of the things we're talking about today. So if any of our listeners happen to be in that part of the country, uh, do email me, chad at execsinthenow.com, and uh, we'd love to have you come out with uh, our dinner gathering uh, next Thursday, June 11th. So with, with this, what I'd like to do as we get ready to kick things off, let me start with the definition of uh, how we view digital service channels. So just to ensure we are all on the same page, and um, uh, some of you may be already aware of this, but I just thought it would be a good starting place. So when I'm thinking of digital service channels, I think of mobile support, I think of web, web uh, support, chat, online chat, virtual agent, video, video support, social support, uh, all those types of uh, continued digital and emerging channels. And I'm, there's probably a few others I missed there quickly, but uh, I, I start that off as definition. The second thing is why this webinar, just to kind of bring us all full circle to the objectives today and making sure we're all getting most out of our time. You know, really what my intent with our, our guest panelists and, and myself is to discuss ideas and strategies to leverage the digital service channels to the fullest extent. Uh, as we go and continue, I have some other data points I'll show with you. Uh, these are continued uh, topics of discussion and interest. We're going to talk a little bit about discussing effectively combining data, design, and experience. We're going to have a discussion on how predictive analytics are empowering organizations to anticipate customer intent, some of the pros and cons uh, with that. Um, how to leverage true omni-channel data. I uh, always hear the data dilemma thing, but um, how to improve you know, the data to improve the self-service and the first call resolution. And at the end of the day, we're all striving to try to reduce our customer effort and make uh, their experience with us enjoyable as we uh, service their needs. And then finally, how we look to integrate customer-facing touch points to provide a personalized and frictionless experience. And I would say with all of that, uh, there is uh, so much uh, that you know, we can continue to talk about and be involved with uh, in those, those discussions. So a little bit about us, uh, quickly, for those that are not aware of. You know, Execs in the Know has really been um, uh, really involved in helping brands do the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, brand mentorship. And um, you, um, you also, we, we work in many different ways to provide various industry content, uh, current trends, peer-to-peer uh, -peer uh, partnerships and networking. If you haven't been involved with us, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, lots of ways you can find out at our website, execsinthenow.com. And uh, we really are here as advocates for you, the customer professional, and we really want to help uh, propel best practice sharing uh, within your areas. I want to call out uh, some of our advisory board with Execs in the Know. Um, the advisory board is uh, some of the top executives in customer care, many from today's prominent brands, as you can see, really appreciative of their input and passion for the success of the overall industry. Each of these individuals and respective brands are committed towards the ongoing success, learning, and sharing of the overall connected consumer multi-channel engagement. So uh, all of them have been just uh, gr very graceful in their time and involvement and uh, being involved uh, with us and uh, very appreciative. 
for our listeners, uh, if you're not aware, of, our next national event uh, is going to be in Seattle at the Customer Response Summit. Uh, that's September 28th to the 30th. We've got some pre-activities planned at Microsoft. We've got keynotes from Microsoft at a very senior level and LinkedIn at a very senior level. We've got a ton of brands coming out to talk about best practice sharing. So. Uh, hopefully your plans can include joining us uh, in uh, the Customer Response Summit Seattle. There are always great, great engagements uh, that we have over the two days. So before going to some of my data points, I just want to really thank Daniel uh, Kong and Janet Daly for joining us as guest panelists today. Um, Daniel and Janet are going to show us how to do this, how to do it well, how to do it right, so no pressure on those two, but uh, uh, it's been a great journey and learning um, that both of them had and some of the insights. What I'll do is uh, when Janet and Daniel do present, uh, Daniel and Janet, I just ask you to share a little bit about your background and uh, your accountabilities, and uh, that would be fantastic if you could give the listeners some insights on that. So one thing I want to point out as you look at this list, everyone, take a quick look here. We just recently did some road shows. We were in Toronto and Atlanta. Uh, this is very current. This was from May of 2015. Um, and one of the things we asked uh, some of the people was that what is on their mind? What are they really trying to solve? Fast forward to May 2015. And uh, these were the kind of things that we heard repeatedly. They're in no particular order. They're in no particular priority. Not sure if any of these come as a surprise to any of our listeners, but uh, these are the things that uh, we're kind of hearing across different areas of uh, the country as we attend and have various conversations. I'd also like to offer up uh, execs in the know along with uh, our, our research partner, Digital Roots, twice a year. We do provide some corporate and consumer insights on multi-channel. Uh, we, the all can be downloaded at no cost uh, on our website under resources tab. You can find all of our previous reports. It's been really good to see the three, four year combination of the reports to how corporate capabilities tie into consumer expectations and to, uh, consumers uh, loyalty towards brand. So if you haven't seen these reports, they are free. Uh, complimentary, available. There are a lot of great data points. I would encourage you to leverage that data within your respective organization. One of the things, there were like 48 slides in our last corporate report, which we just released in February of this year. Uh, we talked a little bit about what percentage of total consumer actions occur in each specific channel of care and averaged out the responses by channel. Not surprisingly, the bulk of consumer actions continue to occur within traditional care channel. I think all of you would agree with that in your own organizations. Um, and uh, you know, outside of the, uh, I, I guess that bulk happening within that channel, 28% of all consumer actions are occurring within emerging channels of care, and still in a very important and growing uh, piece of all. I put some definitions here. Uh, what each of these channels mean. So again, you can see very specific data points of each of these channels within that uh, report. So uh, do have a look and download. If you have any problems getting the report, just email me, chad at execsintheno.com, and uh, I'll be happy to get that uh, full download report over to you. One of the things I just want to throw, uh, you know, one thing uh, we get is about what service going to look like in five years. Um, I've been thinking of the last five years uh, where we were in the initial conversations of our leadership gatherings and discussions and kind of where we are today. Um, my prediction is that I believe um, we'll continue to experience growth, of course, across all channels of care. Why traditional call volume will decrease, I don't think it's going to be overly substantial. I think the reason being is that most organizations are just not in a position where they can effectively resolve customer issues in emerging channels of care. That doesn't mean we're, it's impossible, we give up and we don't care. I don't mean to advocate that. There are people doing some really great innovative things. But I think the issue is the next five years will be a time of growth and I think great strides are going to be made. But in the meantime, I still think there are just too many issues still forced in the traditional care for issue resolution for a variety of reasons. But it, what it comes down to, folks, is that it really is just knowing your brand, knowing your customers, and understanding your own journey mapping. And uh, each of that can look so different depending on maturity of that organization, type of industry, 
uh, I don't want to be holistic in this, but I, I truly believe in the next five years we will see a decrease in traditional, but not to the degree that some of the other things I've seen and read uh, out there. Um, now I'm going to turn to the group here. I want to get everyone, if you take a minute and just look at your screen, um, I want to launch a poll here, and I'm going to ask you to take a couple of minutes uh, as I as I do this. So um, as I get ready to launch this poll, you all can vote. So take a look at your screen here. It just takes a second. I've just launched it. So please vote. Which of the following statements best describes your current digital strategy for customer engagement? And as you know, I had shared with you what I saw as the definition of digital at the beginning, for just for clarification purposes. So just take a minute and give your thoughts. I see you guys are all voting. Thank you very much. We'll all get to see this. I'm going to close it down here in about 10 seconds. So if you haven't, do it now. And five, four, three, two, one. Poll is closed. So I'm going to share this poll. Um, and does, I hope uh, everyone can see that. Uh, Daniel, do you see the results on there? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Just want to make sure we're seeing it. So what is this telling us, Daniel? We see 40% have selected creating an omni-channel connection uh, or context persists through that. I mean, what's your reaction to that voting, Daniel? I, I, I don't think it's uh, that much of a surprise. Um, I thought I, I would actually had assumed that a lot of the enterprises they're in the mode of being reactive to try to support all the touch points that their customers are um, want to engage with them on. But then obviously in the next step in digital is to connect everything, connect the dots together, make sure that you yeah. have the holistic view of the customer. So so this is, so this is somewhat in line with what I expected and I'm glad to see that our audience is mostly about creating the omni-channel connected journey. Perfect. Thank you, Daniel. I know you've got a lot you want to share, and I don't want to tie us up too much longer. Janet, do you have any quick reaction from your perspective on these results or the breakout here? No, they're actually sort of aligned with what I would think. And, um, you know, creating an omni-channel connected journey is certainly something I'm focused on, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But knowing, you know, how things are evolving very quickly in how customers really want to connect with a company, this isn't surprising. Okay, and then I'm going to take us through one more. Everyone bear with me. I've got another poll I'm going to ask you here. Um, and let me make sure in relation to your current investment. Oops. See, they put Chad in charge of the slides, and I always have a hard time with this stuff here. Um, so the next question would be, um, sorry about that, everyone. Okay, in relation to your current investment priorities, how does digital customer engagement rank within your organization? So last question. I've launched the poll. Go at it. Take a minute. Just if I want to really appreciate your participation, just take a minute, add into it. Um, We'll close it down here in about 10 seconds. Interesting to see how this one's coming out. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. And I'm going to close that poll, and now here's the results. Daniel, back to you. What's your reaction? I, I think this is in line, which is why everyone is, is here on the webinar. Right. It's very encouraging to see this. Yeah, it, it, I don't think there's a shocker here, but it definitely speaks to kind of what we're all rank and file dealing with, respectively across our brands. And one of the reasons execs and know is so committed to this is to really help foster and leverage, uh, I think, the common sharing and learning and uh, bringing out best practice examples. And I know, Janet, thank you very much for your time today, and you're going to share some of that. So uh, I'm, I think we can get a screen capture of those results. Uh, I'll be happy to send them to everyone uh, post-show. Um, so please, uh, uh, if you want those, uh, we'll make sure we get them there and we'll have that data. So, Danny, I'm going to turn things over to you here. And again, if you could just, for the purpose of the audience, give them a little bit about your role and background. Daniel, before we start, for all of our listeners, uh, you know, 24-7, uh, 
uh, has been, you know, 24 7 Inc. customers have been just a great partner of Execs in the Know. You guys have been doing so many things out there to really be in front of the audiences uh, to really advocate industry best practice and learning and sharing. So I really appreciate your uh, facilitation in that. So Daniel, uh, turn it over to you. Great. Uh, thank you, Chad. And the feeling is mutual. What Execs in the Know has done in the industry is, has just been um, quite profound in terms of bringing together the right thought leaders to have the right discussions that we need to to really evolve and take the industry to the next level. Now, um, just a real quick background uh, for me. So I am the Senior Director of Product Marketing Strategy at 24-7. So I essentially uh, do a lot of uh, the messaging and strategy around what makes 24-7 unique and different at the platform level. What are the unique channel orchestration digital experiences that we enable our customers, the large enterprises, to provide to their customers. And then also everything under the hood of how we do prediction, how we take data, how we leverage that, and, and really try to drive business outcomes. So um, I, I, I just want to uh, say I do have some roots in the telecom industry, so pardon me for borrowing the expression the last mile and applying that to today's world of digital, but I think it's, it's very relevant to what enterprises need to think about and execute on today over the next couple of years to create and, and to sustain competitive advantage where customer experience comes to the fore for enterprises. So um, the question is, and we answered this in the poll, like what, what does digital really mean for you, the enterprise? And most of you had said 40% about cr uh, creating that connected omni-channel journey where the context persists across all the different um, touch points. So the customer and the enterprise um, are, are really in sync and in line. And I think that that's, that's important because the way you engage your customers, and not just in one touch point, but the entirety of the journey will determine the success of your business over the long term because there's just so much channel and device jumping happening in a single journey. Um, some of the stats that I've come across, over 90% of customers are using three channels to resolve an issue in customer service. Um, and, and given that 65% of customers begin their customer service journey on the web, 90% of consumers begin on the web for purchasing a product or service, digital has really kind of become the company's front door for your customer. Now, um, everyone here I'm sure is familiar with the term, the last mile. It's that phrase used by the telecom industry uh, to refer to the final leg of the telecommunications network which delivers communications connectivity to the customers. It's a part that actually reaches the customer. Now, um, for the better part of the last five years with the rise of the customer experience and the consumerization of customer service, there, there's really been uh, intense focus on the customer. And while we all know it's about the customer, the notion of the last mile in digital is about you, the enterprise. Um, so essentially the last mile in digital are those moments during a customer's journey that would have gone uh, that would have otherwise gone undiscovered or overlooked where you, the enterprise, can provide an experience in such a way that there, there's immediate performance gains in key metrics that impact your top and bottom line, such as engagement, revenue, NPS, and CSAT. And it's, it's a part that actually impacts you, uh, the enterprise. Um, if you could build out the slide here, uh, when, when it comes, and, and when it comes to digital, you've all probably heard these terms being used frequently. You had uh, data. Uh, and this is where you think about big data, uh, data analytics, data visualization, design, think about branding, user experience, or user interfaces, and the experience, the touch points, the channels, voice of the customer. And, and while digital is a shell, um, they're, like data, design, and experience are really the pillars that are, are needed for any successful digital customer engagement strategy. The problem is that they tend to exist in their own silos uh, within organizations today. So what we haven't heard a lot about and where it gets really interesting is combining data and design to power and shape experiences. Being able to say you have data-driven design in your journeys and that your experiences are shaped by data. And the successful combination of these elements is how companies are able to essentially turn up the volume in their business outcomes. In other words, this is how you can really be successful in digital. So 
how do you know that you've kind of achieved that last mile in digital? Uh, and, and there are typically there's a, three indicators. The first is that your touch points become hyper efficient and hyper effective. So um, according to a survey, a research now survey that we sponsored of 3,000 consumer respondents, about 80% uh, of customers said that they wanted better self-service capabilities when they're going shopping online or seeking customer support. Essentially, they want to do things themselves, but not only that, they also want predictive experiences. They want companies to anticipate their needs and they get service proactively by the enterprise. And with that, customers also want engagement to straddle all the touch points that the customers want to use to interact with the enterprise. And within those touch points, there should be rich multimedia supported. So ultimately what the data shows is that the customers expect more out of engaging with enterprises and the channels that they engage with them on, on today. So um, hyper-efficient and hyper-effective, it's really about applying and successfully, successfully leveraging uh, data and design. So in the area of hyper-efficient, how can you move the needle for automation rates that you, in your mind, you think have already hit the limit? Let's say you're at 75% automation rates, how can you increase that to 85%? And it's, it's really about taking a step back and, and, and guiding the customer, um, guiding the engagement by leveraging the journey data and then applying predictive analytics and taking the right action in that journey in real time. So for example, if a customer was on a website and then makes a phone call, the IVR should probably have context passed on from what the customer is trying to do on the website to provide a, a personalized experience where there is an opportunity for self-service or partial, uh, partial self-service in the IVR interaction on the phone channel. And the reality is that um, the calls today hitting contact centers, they've become far more complex and that's because of the proliferation of other channels. And that's, um, their customers are essentially able to um, do more self-service in other channels. So the nature of calls hitting the contact centers are, are uh, just a lot more complex. In the area of hyper-effective, um, uh, sorry, can you go back to the um, previous slide, Chad? Um, how to make touch points between agents and customers essentially become more effective. And that's really about empowering the agents, uh, giving them the, um, the tools that are designed specifically for the digital realm, um, giving them tools to be able to like push rich content to the customer, like pushing a form to the customer on his or her smartphone, or, or um, while the agent is, is talking to the customer on, on the phone, they could push rich content or via a chat session, they could push rich content. And it doesn't stop there. The agent shouldn't um, also be constrained to an interaction on one channel and one device, but they're also able to engage with the customer across different channels and different devices concurrently. And remember customers, uh, like I think we saw a number of our, our clients, like 50% of their customers are on the website while making a phone call. So they're hitting them at, at two different channels concurrently. And also behind the scenes, giving the agents an, an analytics driven workspace where the console is, is essentially powered by predictive analytics to guide the agent on how best to serve the customer dynamically in the journey. Now in the area of, of analog uh, becomes digital, there's 45 billion inbound calls that will be made to customer service this year in the US, UK, and Australia. And that's a very large number. Um, in fact, uh, and Chad pointed to this earlier with the traditional channels, the phone channel still accounts for 80% of inbound customer interactions. And there's obviously a massive opportunity here uh, to get those customers onto digital. So bringing analog to di digital means digitizing the phone channel you know, through orchestration, uh, to and with other channels and giving the customer the best treatment for their particular journey on their, based on their intent, their background and preferences. So this can be an IVR rendering visual experiences, essentially morphing the phone call into fully automated mobile and multimodal experience for that see and touch experience. Or giving a caller the ability to make a phone call and then they can book a mobile chat session with an agent as opposed to uh, uh, just talking to an agent, maybe they want to chat or also during a phone call, and I touched on this earlier, the agent can push rich content to the customer's phone or their tablet, that they could push like a form or informative video tutorial. Um, it also means understanding what devices or, or, or 
what device or devices your customer is currently using and being able to have an orchestrated experience that can involve customer second screening concurrently. And finally, um, there's when you hit that last mile in digital, uh, incrementality becomes reality. So um, by incrementality, I mean like additional revenue or increased engagement or improvements in MPS or CSAP that would not have occurred without a specific campaign. It's, it's being um, able to use data to obtain additional performance enhancement without uh, cannibalizing your business. For example, a person wants to purchase something online, don't interject. Let the customer do what he or she has set out to do, which is purchase. But in those instance, instances when a customer is not likely to buy, incrementality involves using data sciences and, and data, essentially, to identify those customers, target them, and engage them. For example, offer them a proactive chat to engage the customer at the right time in the journey to close the sale. And um, that's essentially what uh, incrementality becomes reality. What, what we've done and the benchmarks that we've achieved in our organizations, we've helped the client increase NPS by 30 um, by, by having some unique personalization in real time based off of uh, predicting what the customer's intent is. And we've also helped drive um, over uh, about $250 million uh, in, in annual revenue, incremental annual revenue for, for our customers. So um, here, uh, if you go to the next slide, here are four quick examples of implementations that I've been talk, talking quite a bit about in, in, the, in, the, in the previous slide. So um, there's two here and two after. So these are all live today. Um, the first one is, is a visual IVR experience. I think this is a great example of how um, hyper-effective, hyper-efficient um, comes together with moving that analog phone call to a digital experience and having incrementality on top. So uh, uh, this is deployed live with American Express. Um, in the past, you may have gotten um, a, a call that says, do you recognize the past five uh, transactions? And uh, essentially, you would have to listen to the past five transactions uh, to see which one would be potentially fraud. But in it, that, that was a poor customer experience. So what we did with American Express is we deployed this visual IVR experience in that phone call. Um, when there's a potential fraud on your card, it would, it would say, hi, um, Chad, are you, uh, we noticed there's possible fraud. Would you like to see those charges? And then an SMS would be sent to you. You could click on that, and now you can actually see those charges. You could double click on those charges um, so you can get a better understanding of, of what that charge is all about, where you can could, you could see the location and just get a lot more details on that. Um, the impact was 86% of the users, they um, accepted the multimodal invite, 92% um, success rate of the application and is very highly rated, 87% of the customers rated the experience with four or five stars. Now all of this, um, American Express didn't do any uh, advertising of this, of this, they just rolled it out to their customers. It's very intuitive and there's a high stickiness factor amongst the customers. Um, now moving on, the phone to chat. This is essentially, um, I'm sorry, can you go back? Uh, in, in phone to chat here on the right side of the screen, um, this is a deployment where in a phone call, uh, uh, a customer makes a phone call. This is deployed live, by the way, with a major uh, carrier. Um, so the phone call uh, hits the IVR and uh, the IVR will sense that there's a, a maybe five to 10 minute wait time to talk to an agent and it'll give the customer the option to not wait and to chat with an agent right there if, the, if a chat agent is available. And that actually, customers really like that experience. 95% first contact resolution rate for chat versus 70% over, over the voice channel. There's 15% in call deflection and a 34% increase in NPS because uh, of this experience. Next slide. Now, um, I talked about the agent pushing the rich content down to the customer. Here is an, another example of that. Um, we're essentially calling, um, calling this like an augmented agent experience. And this is deployed live with a large carrier as well. And let's say you are a customer, you're calling in and you want to, uh, you're asking about iPhone 6 versus the latest Samsung Galaxy. You just want to do a, a comparison. And uh, the agent can actually push rich content to you on the phone call so you could talk to the agent while you're going through the features and functions and the pricing and, and just a lot more details about the devices. So it's a very 
much of more of an immersive experience. And there, the engagement rate was very high, 75%. It also increased sales conversion by 10% and reduced the average handle time by 12%. Now, in the area of journey level prediction, um, this is deployed live. I, it's with a major airline. I'm sure half, more than half of us on the call have taken this airline, if not more. Um, so you're on the website and uh, you are trying to book a ticket. There's an error code that pops. And then from there, you're, um, you make a phone call. And that um, phone call will say, hi, Chad, are you calling about the ticket you're trying to book? And then all that context, it, it's a personalized IVR engagement. And then you would say yes, and then all that context is passed on to the agent when um, after you say yes, and then it just uh, dramatically d decreases the um, average handle time, improves the per, uh, personalization time. Also, the IVR calling gets reduced, um, and and uh, obviously there's a CSAT increase. We don't have the numbers right now to share with you; um, they're confidential. But I think over the next few months we should have um, we, we should have the numbers to share with you. On, on the the impact in average handle time and CSAT. So so that's the level. Um, in that deployment, we, uh, recession predicting what the customer was doing on the website um, based off of the context, and then based off of that, have a dynamic IVR uh, treatment for that customer. So, so Dan, Chad, I mean, just to, and you know, from time perspective, I mean, would there be a quick takeaway or main thing from you've been sharing a lot of very rich potentials that do exist today as we speak? Is there any main takeaway? Uh, that you'd just like to really embark on uh, the listeners from this? Yeah, I, I think um, the underlying thing is you have to create a strategy uh, really around data and data flowing into the customer experience. Know that um, the entire line of sight to your customer, figure out what their intent, intent is, anticipate their needs, and serve them the best way as possible. And you could get very creative in the world of digital because you could start blending channels and having orchestrated experiences. Uh, the only thing is doing that effectively really requires you as an enterprise to have a lot of other departments kind of come together and have best practices from an organizational perspective. Great, um, if you can go to the next slide, Chad. Um, so all of this requires, it, it's a lot of work bringing data, design, and experience together to, to drive, to get those types of outcomes. Um, if you go to the next slide. So, um, and you could just build this out. Uh, so, so first and foremost, it's, it's about you being able to leverage data, which I just talked about, anticipating that customer intent and acting on it. And how we do that is, is by taking that customer data taking journey data and session data, and then combining them to make predictions. And this enables us to, uh, to determine who to target. Uh, you can build up the slide is, um, there, I think there's one more slide. So this enables us to uh, um, determine who to target, when to intervene, how to engage, and what to recommend, whether it's for online sales or customer service. So if you could go to the next slide. So um, one more, Chad. So here, here's just a, an example of an omni-channel journey where everything kind of comes together and I'll really uh, quickly touch on the sausage uh, kind of making process of what's going on underneath the hood. So um, let's say there's a customer, Bethany, um, she calls to complain that her credit card is not working. Uh, we know that she checked her account balance on the website uh, just two hours ago. So when she calls through the IVR it's, and, and, and asks her, um, how may I help you today? Um, she would say, my card is not working. So uh, essentially, we do know her entire journey, where she began, what steps that she took, and we could take that context and then apply that to, to that phone channel. So if you could go to the next slide. <clears throat> if you were to predict, if you were a betting person, if you were to predict what it was that she was trying to do, and just from that, her making a phone call and saying her card isn't working, chances are that there's a fraud block, there's potential fraud on her card, or she hit her credit card limit. And, and that's just really a single view of, of um, figuring out or kind of predicting what it is that this uh, customer needs are and why she's calling. However, if you build out the slide here, Chad, um, when you bring in 
uh, data from other channels, like what she was doing on the website before. We know that she was logged into her account. We know that she also sees that her card is, uh, her, her payment is overdue. Um, her member profile, the CRM history, also shows that um, her, her payment is overdue. She also engaged with a uh, chat agent, and um, the chat agent even kind of nudged her saying uh, that her, her, her credit card it, bill is overdue, she has to make a payment. And then this also, this all kind of fuses together, all this information, all this data, and now it goes into the intent prediction engine where we know uh, without uh, you know, any, any doubt that the reason why her card is not working is that uh, she did not make a payment. And that's why when she's making a phone call, at that, and you could build out the rest, um, that in, in that phone call, we need to um, A, um, get her to make a payment, but you have to kind of figure out that she did not um, kind of put one and one together. She may not have known that she, because she didn't make the payment, that's why her credit, that's why her card is not working. So in a non-judgmental way, in a very, very safe way to, uh, and very friendly way, you have to kind of express to her and educate her on, on why that card is not working. So in the future, she doesn't run into these issues again, but you also need to um, have kind of that uh, IVRB dynamic to get her to make that payment. So if you go to the next slide. So um, while data may be data, predictive analytics is, is really the engine, the, the chassis or, or, or like the body is data and I, I mean it is design. So like those really go hand in hand and I think um, with design there really has to be a holistic end-to-end -end perspective of the user experience. Uh, we have a team that looks at the entire um, customer journey and then designs based off of that, the entire user experience. And they use best practices, creating personas, they use user research tools. They really understand the moments of truth. And then they also apply data to that where they're um, constantly uh, using design of experiments, which include A-B testing, but also multivariate testing to really provide the optimal experience in those touch points, but overall throughout the entire journey whether customers do channel transitions or channel jumping or, or using different channels concurrently at the same time. Um, this really provides kind of that wow factor for customers when they are engaging with you on that uh, in digital. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, so that's, this is essentially, here's my sales pitch. <laughs> it's, this is what we're about at 24-7. We're about effectively combining data design to shape very unique digital experiences that could bring together different channels or, or, or in a single channel have a very unique differentiated experience where you anticipate the customer's needs and act on that to drive those outcomes. And then we also have um, our, like, we also back that with a performance guarantee, guaranteeing a certain threshold because we're about outcome-based pricing. Next slide. And that's, that's it in a nutshell. Um, to go the last mile in digital, just remember you can really start squeezing and improving the performance, moving the needle, becoming hyper-efficient, hyper-effective, leveraging data and design effectively to do that. Um, taking those analog interactions that are just siloed, bring them into the digital realm bring them into the digital canvas where you could run very effectively with the customer because you could push rich content at your customer and the customer can do that back to you, vice versa. So it's a better community there. And finally, incrementality becomes a reality in terms of performance. Thank you, Chad, and, and, and over to you. Well, thank Thanks you so much, fun. Daniel. Really appreciate it. Really opening our, in, our, our perspectives to the possibilities that exist. And I think every one of us has got to look internally and, and, and see some of those possibilities and how we're leveraging, not leveraging, and, and where we get our own unique wins. And, and Janet, you're going to bring it all to perspective now because uh, you've got a, a, a big job over there at Starbucks. and. Uh, a lot of unique things you guys are doing and, uh, you, you know, just how you're impacting customer success and loyalty and everything in that regard. So, Janet, really appreciate your time. I know how busy you are. And uh, maybe we just start off, Janet, uh, tell the listeners a little bit about what you've got accountability responsibilities for. And uh, I know a lot of people are looking forward to hearing uh, your perspectives. Sure. Thanks so much, Chad. And again, my name is Janet Bailey, and I'm the Director of Customer Service here at Starbucks in sunny Seattle, Washington. And I say sunny with some extra pep because it truly is sunny today, which makes us all very happy here. 
And so I lead a team uh, that is responsible for customer service, primarily focused on our contact centers. And so um, many of you uh, I'm sure have heard of Starbucks, and I thought it was important that when we talk about our customers that I start out with really what is our mission and the values. And I'm not going to read the entire slide here, but really the mission of the company is to inspire and nurture the human spirit, one person, one cup, and one neighborhood at a time. And there's different ways that we go about that uh, in our values. But one of the phrases we use a lot is we are a performance-driven company looking through the lens of humanity. And so uh, if you want to go ahead and, and click to the next slide, this is sort of the, the next layer below that uh, mission and value around Starbucks. And so I will share one of my proudest moments of being a Starbucks partner, we're called partners, uh, not employees, was to be on the team who created this, what we call our customer service vision. And uh, today that is sewn inside the front of every apron. So when you put your apron on in the morning, that is what you look at as you put that over your head. And really, um, you know, we create inspired moments in each customer's day. And those four words underneath are what we call our pillars. They're the things that hold up that vision, anticipate, connect, personalize, and own. And so I get to figure out how to do that when somebody's not in a store, when they're trying to contact us, when they're trying to get an answer. Um, and you know, while there are many, many similarities when you're in a store looking somebody in the eye around customer service, and when you're talking to somebody on the phone, there are some unique differences. And also, we have the incredible sort of gift of being able to collect a lot of information around why those customers are contacting us or why they're out looking for things. Problems are an incredible gift. And uh, I'll talk a little bit later, but uh, you know, while there are many times that you know the phone is ringing and the emails are coming in, and you know, how do we get this to stop? Kind of mentality can overtake. To, you know, our daily lives, those problems really are an incredible gift. And so my role at Starbucks, um, I, when people say, what do you do? I usually say my job is to make it easy to be a customer and meet them where they want to be met when they want help. And so if you want to go to the next slide. I thought this was interesting. This was pulled together. Um, these are just around customers in general, not unique to Starbucks. but. You know, when we think about digital, when we think about the new ways customers try to get assistance or try to get a problem solved, some of these are really interesting, and I, I thought I'd include them. For instance, by 2020, consumers will manage 85% of their relationships without having to talk to a human. And, uh, you know, we are the society that is quickly um, getting to the point where we don't necessarily want to talk to each other. And I would argue that that's not always good, but it is the reality of today. Uh, we spend three hours a day on phone, our phone, two hours on a tablet or laptop, 36 minutes engaging our families, uh, 800 million updates to Facebook every day. We unlock our, our phone 110 times per day on average. So these are things to think about. Uh, and our customers, again, when they're asking us to solve problems, they're telling us uh, the same sort of information by way of how they're trying to connect with us. So Janet, I teased you a little bit about these stats. There's really 60 million people unhappy and lonely. I know. I, you know, <laughs> I, I just think, you know, when I when I think of the Starbucks brand, what an incredible moment to connect with someone. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, many many customers are in our stores or doing other things uh, related to Starbucks. Maybe maybe it can be 59 million that are unhappy, courtesy of of their connection with us. So we're well, going to take go a quick to a poll. poll, right, Janet? Yep, yeah, and this is just a, a question that will play into a little bit about what I'm, I'm going to talk about. And so, you know, high-level question, are you a member of My Starbucks Rewards? Uh, and so if you're not, uh, you may not even know what My Starbucks Rewards is, but if you have a Starbucks card, you might know what it is. And so uh, just curious. Yeah, I'll give it, are uh, Starbucks members. And you can help those that are no, but I'm thinking of becoming one on the convert. Um, <laughs> All right, we're going to close this poll down in about 10 seconds, guys. Just take a minute, uh, have a little fun there. Ooh, interesting stats. Uh, you ready for this, Janet? I'm ready. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. We're going to close it. Now I'm going to share it. Mm. So, well, there you go. <laughs> So 
So I'm going to move next slide. Okay. So many of you are my Starbucks Rewards members. Many of you are not. Um, I highly encourage you, if you do go to Starbucks, to use a Starbucks card and join my Starbucks Rewards, and that'll be my pitch for the day. But when we go, get even a layer deeper, I wanted to share a little bit about our reality. And when I say our reality, I'm talking about our contact centers and, and sort of the different ways customers are trying to connect with us outside of our stores. So 75% of our calls are contained in our IVR. Great news. That's great, great news. It's sort of been um, a journey and it will continue to be. But um, if you're a My Starbucks Rewards member or have a Starbucks card, I'm going to try to help you before you even need to take much more time to speak with somebody. We know that 8 to 10% of the emails that are started um, trying to contact Starbucks, we're able to um, deflect them and answer the question in the moment. But we're continuing to grow. We can also uh, try to mitigate when something maybe is going on out there, um, and that deflection rate will go even higher. In the last There's five years, a lot of great stats here, Janet. They're mm -hmm. unique to you and your brand. And again, if any of our listeners you want to ask questions, uh, please type them in on the chat box, and I'll make sure I try to get them to Janet. Um, I know Janet. When I saw this, I had a million questions myself. But um, mm -hmm. really interesting, the mix and the volume, and you know, just the, the way you guys got to interface. But let, right. please continue. Yeah. Well, and and I'll just go quickly through the rest of these. You know, we're quite popular out on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and, but here's an interesting one. 18% of Starbucks card transactions are paid with our mobile app. I'll tell you that I don't carry a plastic Starbucks card anymore. I use my mobile app. And um, we have a lot of customers out there combing our frequently asked questions, trying to get answers. And our My Starbucks Rewards program is extremely popular and it continues to grow. So what does this all mean? That we must continue to learn from our customers. We have to make it easier for them. And by making it easier for them, we actually make it easier for ourselves as well. Next slide. So this is um, a question we ask in our post-contact survey. And you know, it's a newer version of our post-contact survey. We, we ask many questions. But this one um, is part of the data we're trying to gather to say, where do you want to be met? And so one of the questions is prior to the interaction that you had with our contact center, did you use any of the following resources for assistance? So you know, you were out on our website, you were in our mobile app, maybe you asked an employee or a partner at the store, maybe you called us a few times. And so this is a super important question for us because we want to figure out, number one, where is it you want to meet us? Also, from a business perspective, um, I would venture to say many of those places are probably far less expensive than having a contact come into the contact center, but really, we just want to try to make it easier. And so, overwhelmingly, we know that people are out on our website and in our mobile app, and even a portion of them are telling us, I asked a store partner uh, prior to having to contact you. So we take this data and we're able to tie it together with a lot of different things. So if you want to go to the next slide. So what we do is when you think about contact centers, and this is be quite familiar to all of you, <clears throat> we do a lot of listening. So if you know, customers are coming into our IVRs, maybe they're stopping there. They're coming into the centers, the associates are capturing the reasons you're calling and what they did. They're um, identifying the, the root cause, and we're using a text analytics engine to understand you know, why did you call and what did we do to help you. And then we trend all of that to, to try to understand what are the big problems that we're trying to solve. And we um, work closely with what I call clients, but the business owners within Starbucks to identify those problems. We do um, have a, a unique way of tracking costs and, and different things like that to sort of create visibility and, and have those business over owners have a, some skin in the game, so to speak. And so there's a lot of information that's taken back to them. And then we work cross-functionally with them to try to help them figure out how to solve these problems, to make it easier to be a customer and meet them where they want to be met. And some of that is through technology. Some of it is just you know helping customers understand something quicker. But the feedback is what's very, very, very important in our world. So not only are we capturing everything that the customer tells us via those interactions with, a, with an associate in our contact centers, 
We're also taking what articles are they out reading in our FAQs. We ask for feedback on those. We're taking the data that we're gathering in our post-contact survey, and we can tie it all together to say um, customers for this particular reason, X percent of them were out on our website trying to find that answer. And it might not have been the FAQ portion of the website, it was somewhere else. So there's this continuous sort of feedback and then you know, improvement along the way to try to reduce that volume into our contact center, to try to make it easier to be a customer, to try to meet them where they want to be met. And then we build out our strategies, not only with those business units, but even as a, a contact center customer service support team to say, where should we go next? And I'll tell you, we're not done and we'll never be done. We uh, are in, we're yeah, investing you, you, a lot in technology. I, I was just going to say you've lit up our boards with questions. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I was just going to wrap um, up here. So. I'm just going to throw a couple in here real quick, if I yeah. may. Um, Nancy's asking, um, you know, for you, Janet, what text analytics engine do you use, and is it uh, tied into the other apps like CRM, sales database, et cetera? Is there any? Uh, so that may be proprietary. I don't. You may not be able to share, but do you have any comment on any of that? Yeah, we use, we use a vendor for the text analytics. Today, I would say one of the huge opportunities and one of the things we're investing in is some improved technology and integrations. So today, the, the data that we're at capturing and using that text analytics uh, functionality it happens to be the, the same vendor who's our post-contact survey. Um, that's ours. Uh, and then we sort of deliver that back to these other teams, and then they try to tie it together. Unfortunately, we're not integrated. It's on a roadmap. Um, because I think that's probably a common problem with many of us is that we work in silos, and so how do we tie it all together? So we've done a great job tying it together in our world, but now we're trying to figure out how do we sort of create the bigger understanding of customer. Perfect. And I'm just going to throw a couple quick ones in here. I don't want to uh, distract too much from your presentation, but as Scott's asking on a high level, what are the major inquiry types you're seeing? Any yeah, I mean. That? <laughs> Starbucks card and my Starbucks rewards. Um, they're extremely popular. Uh, the stored value card, um, it's sort of unique if you think about it. I never really thought about it this way until I worked for Starbucks. Most of us get a gift card, uh, we use it, and we toss it uh, to where the Starbucks card is something that people reload over and over again. Um, they use it every day. Uh, it's also a very popular gift, and so that would be the biggest portion of our world. But we're also many brands. We're not when I say we, it's our contact centers, uh, things like Sales Best Coffee, Tazo, you know, a, a whole list of brands, corporate. Um, but the bulk of it, I would say, is, is around this very, very popular program. And if you're up for one more, I'll, I'll go quickly again. Um, thank you. Uh, Mohammed asked, do you currently manage Starbucks customers' preferences and how? Preferences as far as, I'm, I guess I have a follow-up question. I, I would say preferences as far as what drinks they like and, and food they want to see and everything. Uh, if we collect that information into the contact center because customers are very, very connected with us. Uh, I was sharing earlier in a different conversation, people get married in our stores. They have great relationships in our stores. They even, um, if they see somebody else have a bad experience, there are times they'll call us and tell us because they think it's important that we know. So if we give feedback around, um, you know, some sort of loaf or, you know, I, I wish you had this kind of syrup or sauce, that's the data that we're collecting and then slicing and dicing and getting back to the various teams to say these are things, you know, you're, would make your customers happy, uh, but also may actually help your business. Well, we'll have Mohammed clarify if there's anything further on the preferences in that piece. Uh, Janet, we've got a lot of questions, but I'm going to let you continue, <laughs> but let's make sure we leave some time for some uh, Q&A for uh, both you and Daniel. Sure. And actually, this was, um, you know, my last slide is really um, think of every contact that you get, uh, whether it be voice or email or people out there on websites. Uh, Think about mobile apps uh, today. Um, pretty soon it will be nationwide, but I have the luxury in the Pacific Northwest with mobile order and pay. I can order from my meeting, um, swing by the store that just luckily happens to be down the hall from where I sit and get my beverage, never stand in line. Uh, everything's paid for, everything's done. We're going to start delivery service in the Empire State Building over the summer. So you know those are all coming in through digital channels. So uh, we'll never be done, 
and then from behind the scenes, how do we support that from a contact center perspective and then get that data back to the various people who own that, those businesses to say, here's some incredible gifts your, our customers are giving us as far as problems they'd like us to solve for them. Okay, well, uh, we're going to go into some Q&A here, and, and thank you for all the questions that are coming in. Greatly appreciate it. Janet, you're going to be at our Seattle event in September. I mean, you sit on our board, and you happen to be in Seattle, so promptly you're going to keep that weather nice and sunny September 28th and 30th. So uh, it's going to be a pleasure having you uh, out and many other of uh, uh, your peers uh, there, too. So I'm just going to start rifling a few things here, if I may, and again, just from a time perspective. Uh, Susanna, Jana is asking you, uh, how are you handling customer service for my rewards and Starbucks cards in other countries? Good question. You know, it's a work in process. That's uh, that's a lot of um, some of my focus lately. Is um, these are incredibly popular programs. Um, not every market has them, nor are they identical. But um, we've learned a lot. The the great thing about being sort of the U.S. North America part engine of Starbucks is we learn a lot, and so we're trying to take everything that we've learned um, and help support those other markets as these programs come to life. They're extremely popular, and so I'm I'm pretty well connected into those different groups to assist them as they think about launching these. Okay. A quick question, Daniel, for you. Can you just briefly expand about the changing role of the IVR and how to make IVR digital? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that that's a very good question, and it's it's pretty simple. Um, get them onto the browser. Get them onto the mobile web. Bridge that experience. That's one. Or, or link that to your mobile app. Or also uh, use IVR creatively to trigger um, certain interactions. Maybe you're on the website and make a phone call that IVR can trigger, uh, maybe like a chat session on the website. So it's really about getting creative. That IVR, you just have to think outside the box because there's a lot more that can be done with that sunken sunk investment today. Well, I, I want to compliment our listeners. We have a very active group and just trying to, uh, there's so many questions. This is great. Daniel, while we're on you, another question came out from Nancy to you. Uh, what are the key components of the intent prediction model to ensure the results are statistically accurate? Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, so if you're just doing it at scale and you're looking at the outcome and you also measure um, through a variety of different metrics, voice of the customer, CSAT or NPS, um, that's typically a good um, kind of like metric, um, series of metrics to use to gauge the performance of that intent prediction. You could also really just, um, the data scientists that we have can really track the customer throughout the journey and look at um, what percentage of customers are going through here, what the outcome has been. So it's really about taking things at scale and having the right metrics in place. Perfect. Janet, another good question. Stephen, thank you. Uh, this is to you, Janet. Uh, what is the most important in driving a culture where your employees are most engaged in promoting digital? Uh, anything come to mind? You know, I, I most think it's important. I, most important, I, I think, um, it's sort of how we stay connected to our customers and live up to their expectations. Um, so as we think about um, how our partners are involved uh, with the digital components of our world, um, you know, I, I'm customer service, and so I will always go back to sort of my true north around how do we make sure that the connection with them, and connection isn't necessarily digital, but it's more about the culture and the brand, and uh, you know, when at the end of the day, I always go back to our customer service vision in that we have to create an inspired moment in a customer's day. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Janet, how much did you spend on your mobile app? Any ideas of what we should spend on a mobile app? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Thank you for that question. Uh, I don't know if Janet will answer it, but uh, you know, throw out I a actually, number, Janet. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't create our mobile app. Uh, there's a, a fine leader here at Starbucks that is uh, responsible to this day around the mobile app, um, but it's really popular. And so um, I don't, but I don't have that data. So sorry. Daniel, what should we spend on mobile apps, mobile app support? <laughs> Once again, it depends on what your objective is. I, you know, I was just w waiting for Janet to have like a precise answer, like it was two hundred fifty-three thousand four hundred sixty-two dollars and eighty-three cents or something like that. Um, yeah. 
It, it, it really depends on, it, it could vary. Uh, we've had customers that spend as little as 50, but then they have an internal team all the way up to like a quarter million. It, it, it really all depends. It's hard to answer. Yeah, that's a tough one, Keith. If you want some additional stuff, drop me a note and I'll push something out to our community and see if people come back with any averages or insights to, to help you on uh, the data spend. Uh, that would be great. Uh, or, that, or the spend on that, I should say. Um, okay, uh, Janet, how supportive are the business owners are with the feedback from customer service? What's the culture like that in that regard? I guess uh, Chris is asking you know, how supportive are the business owners? <laughs> you know, I would say that um, it's, it's a very, very collaborative environment. And, you know, they have a tough job as well. They're really looking down the road of what's coming next and, and things like that. And the analogy I use is, while I don't want them to always think about me, I'd love it, but <laughs> I, while I don't want to consume every bit of their mind share, uh, you know, they're driving a car and they're going down the road. And what I'd like them to do every once in a while is look in that rearview mirror and I be, may be able to warn them that there's a curve up ahead or that their car is leaking oil. And so that's when I, you know, how I think of it. But they are very engaged and um, they listen to calls. They, we provide them with calls. We, again, slice and dice the data unique to different types of interactions, uh, promotions, things like that. And so while contact centers in general tend to be a bit on the negative side, that's what we're here for, um, that data is very, very valuable and they appreciate it very much. Thank you. And one more or a couple quick ones I want to throw out there. They're not necessarily quick, but I'll try to just to get some answers. Uh, Daniel, maybe to you, um, any advice, suggestions on how do you leverage social and CRM to assist with customer journey? Not sure of the complete question there, but um, they're asking about leveraging social and CRM to assist in the customer journey. I mean, I know it's not, uh, there's some yeah. more questions I would have on that question, but uh, do you have any quick comments on any of that? I mean, the, the, yeah, I, I mean, like there's social could be used in so many different capacities, it's hard to answer. It would really depend on what your business is and what you're trying to achieve and and how you're using social. So like, I, I really can't answer that in in, in a minute. It, it would, um, hopefully I could follow up via email to get a little bit more uh, details. Yeah. Chris, drop me a note, uh, and I'll be happy to uh, leverage on that and uh, try to get you uh, more clarification around it. So uh, feel free to drop me a note at chat execs in the know. Um, yes, a, a presentation will be shared, um, and um, we, once we're done, we'll have all of that uh, out to you with a download and a, a survey. I would ask everyone to help complete, um, and uh, I want to really thank uh, everybody for their time and attention today. The show will be uh, recorded and you'll all receive a copy of that. Um, I really would like to just thank our listeners for your time and attention today. As I said in the beginning, Execs in the Know is here as your advocates. We're here to help you best practice share amongst each other. So if there's unique stories going on within your brand, if there's certain particular successes you're seeing across all channels, we would love to hear from you. Uh, we're here to help bring that awareness and bring that knowledge across all spectrum. So uh, please keep us in mind as that advocacy for you. Everyone have a great day. We're going to close the webinar now. Uh, Janet and Daniel, I cannot thank you enough. You are always uh, just great subject matter experts and insights. Really appreciate your time and attention in, in making this webinar so enjoyable for us. So from execs in the know, my hat's off to both of you, and thank you again. Everybody have a great day, and uh, I hope you'll attend our next uh, webinar with execs in the know. We'll let you know uh, the date and the time. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everyone.